video drops in from the sky. Hi everyone! Um, welcome to the next part in this uh, Astronomy 101 lecture series. Um, this time I'm going to talk about the lives of individual stars. Uh, this is this is um, growing out of the one uh, you should have just watched, um, where I talked a bit about um, how stars are organized on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, the HR diagram, um, and uh, the fact that stars, typically born together in a cluster, um, you get a lot, a lot of little stars and a medium amount of medium stars and very few big stars every time you make a cluster basically out of some ball of gas. Um, the smallest, reddest, uh, less luminous ones, fusion happens more slowly. So even though it's really small, um, it doesn't use up its hydrogen uh, super quickly. Uh, which means that it could live for a very, very long time. The stars at the other ends, the hottest stars, uh, they're really hot and high pressure in the center, um, which means fusion is happening much more rapidly, fusion of hydrogen to helium, um, which makes them much more luminous, but also run out of their fuel faster. Uh, so those are going to have very short lifetimes. Now, short lifetimes could be, you know, tens to hundreds of millions of years less than a billion years. Um, it's not short on human time scales, but uh, that's short on stellar time scales. The sun, um, for example, is, um, is, uh, has a total lifetime of about 10 billion years that it's halfway through. Um, and then stars even smaller than that have longer, longer lifetimes. If you look at all the stars in a cluster and you plot them using their temperature and their luminosity. In this case, they use magnitude, but you know we've been talking luminosity for the most part. Um, you'll notice it doesn't have the whole stripe from the bottom right to the top left. Um, it peels off or turns off um, at a certain point. And where it does so means that this, you know, the star right above this, just died. The star on the end here is about to die. Um, and that gives us a sense of the cluster's age because the cluster has big stars and little stars. The big stars die first, so they're the first ones to disappear from this plot. Um, and the really uh, less luminous, smaller ones are going to stick around a lot longer. Um, so in this example, the yellow cluster is younger than the teal cluster. Um, something that's very important to keep in mind. The mass of a star tells us it's, its lifetime. That's how long it's going to live overall. It does not tell us anything about the current age of that star. So, for example, um, if you talk about the lifetime of a human, uh, say that you know it's 85 years or something like that at average, um, that doesn't mean everyone you see is 85 years old. It means everyone has the ability to be 85 years old. Um, uh, same thing with these stars. These stars down here are the same age as all these other stars, but they have the ability to live for a much longer time. Okay, so that's happening. Um, Hydrogen is fusing to helium in the core. The star is in gravitational equilibrium. Pressure from the mass above is um, counteracted by pressure from fusion pushing out and the star is at a pretty much stable size. Um, this Hertz von Russell diagram just shows us the main sequence. Um, so this is that hydrogen fusing lifetime of the star. Um, for each of these positions, it gives you uh, the rough mass in terms of solar masses. So the mass of the sun is the sun. Uh, you have Stars that are 1.5, 3, all the way up to 60 times the mass of the sun here. Uh, notice the lifetime. 10 to the 10 is 10 billion. That's the sun. The lifetime of a star here is only a billion. Uh, this is 100 million. This is 10 million. I hope I'm backing that up right. Um, so you see the lifetimes get shorter as you go up. You go down here, the lifetimes get longer. So something that is a tenth the mass of our sun 
is going to last for, this is 10, this is 100, that's probably closer to like a trillion years. Um, so that's how long such a star spends um, fusing hydrogen. We say it's on the main sequence. We're going to put a little division in here. We're going to put several divisions in here. Um, high mass stars are ones that are greater than eight solar masses, and that's kind of a key turning point. Low mass stars, uh, like the sun, uh, that's anything less than about two times the mass of the sun. So we're going to talk about low mass stars. We're going to spend time on intermediate mass stars because they pretty much do the same thing as low mass stars. Um, so you can kind of group those together, low and intermediate mass stars, in terms of what they do throughout their life. And then high mass stars are going to be a little different. So ah, let's talk about, uh, let's start talking about these low and intermediate mass stars. Let's talk specifically about uh, the sun to see what's going to happen when it runs out of hydrogen in its core that can fuse in about 5 billion years. So on the left here, this is a uh, star like the sun. It's got hydrogen fusing in the core. Um, and so it's got this outward pressure. Now, when that runs out, it actually just runs out in the center, in the core. There's a layer, there's like a shell of hydrogen fusion around the core. Um, so what that does is put, it's kind of weird, uh, it's, it wants to collapse, but then that hydrogen shell pushes it even further out, um, while the, the center is collapsing. So the center is collapsing because it's run out of fuel. The shell, it says burning here, but it's really fusion, the, the shell where there's still some hydrogen fusion happening, um, is getting hotter and hotter and hotter because what's inside is collapsing. So what's inside is collapsing, it's heating it up, the fusion's starting to go wild in this shell, it's gonna put more and more power out, it's gonna force the star to get bigger. So we're no longer, oops, in equilibrium, this fusion force, because this hydrogen burning shell is shrinking and getting hot at the same time, it's actually pushing more pressure out. And so that causes the star to get larger. Now, if something, if, if a ball of gas, this ball of gas gets larger, it actually cools down all of these outer layers. So you have a star that's the same mass, because all the same material is still there, but it's poofed out a bit. So it's larger in radius, in physical extent, but it's cooler. The surface is cooler, and so it becomes redder. This is the stage of a star uh, called a red giant. So after the hydrogen fusion runs out in the core of the sun, this process is going to happen and it's going to turn into a red giant. So that means its luminosity is going to increase because it's getting bigger, but its temperature is going to decrease as it's getting redder. So what you see is if you plot the, the sun's position over time. Um, again, this is over a fairly long time span in human years. Um, the sun is going to spend some time as a red giant somewhere here in this area. Um, stars of different masses, different stuff going on are going to be different places along this line, but basically um, you're going to have stars that are red giants. So they're going to start to populate this part of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So we call this an evolutionary track, the way it moves through the diagram, again, not moving in space, um, but changing its luminosity and temperature so that it's in a different position on the diagram. What that helps us with is when we look at a whole bunch of stars in a cluster, remember, we can start to figure out some things about the cluster as a whole based on where stars are. Okay, so, uh, eventually, so here's the main, here's another diagram. Uh, here's the main sequence. It's burning, it's, excuse me, fusing. <sighs> A lot of older astronomy sources use burning, even though it's nothing like chemical burning, like fire, um, it's, it's fusion. So hydrogen fusion in the core, it's in equilibrium. It's not showing the different sizes here, but it's showing you when it's a red giant. Um, the helium that was created from the hydrogen fusion is collapsing 
Um, the hydrogen burning, excuse me, hydrogen <laughs> fusing shell is heating up and the stars bake. Eventually, that core of helium is going to contract small enough that it'll be hot enough and high pressure enough that you will get uh, helium fusion in the core. So you have helium fusion in the core and you have hydrogen fusion in a shell around it. And it's starting to get a little more complicated. Um, what that does overall is it shrinks the star. Uh, it turns out it's, it's not taking as much, it's not sending as much energy out as you think it might. Um, but it is shrinking. So the, I guess the luminosity, the, the energy pressure coming from the center isn't as much when helium is fusing, um, as opposed to when that hydrogen burning shell alone is fusing. So star shrinks, um, and heats up. So because it's the same amount of gas shrinking, that's going to heat it up. So it's going to get smaller, therefore dimmer, but also hotter. So it's going to move over to the left. So it moves over to this area of the diagram, um, which is typically called the red clump, because when you make a bunch of points <laughs> are the individual stars, there's like a clump of points right there. So helium fusion is happening at this part, um, this part in the star in the star's life. So a star like the sun. Um, so it's going to be here on the diagram. OK, here's another inside. Uh, Here's another quick look at that uh, for size. When the sun is a red giant, it gets really big. It actually will uh, get big enough to swallow up Mercury and get pretty close to Venus, um, which would burn it even worse than it is hotter than it is now. Um, when it's on the red clump, we also call the horizontal branch when it shrinks. You've got helium fusion in the core. Helium is now fusing to create carbon. It's smaller, but you've already blasted. Um, you've already blasted mercury. You've already burned up mercury. When it becomes a red giant one more time, because it runs out of helium fusion eventually, it's called a AGB or asymptotic giant branch. That just means the line of stars on the plot looks like um goes asymptotic just kind of describes the shape um, but it's even larger and even cooler can it can be even cooler um so it'll swallow up venus and possibly earth although by that point it has well since already burned off all of earth evaporated off all water leaving the earth a lifeless rock um so you have helium built up from the main sequence stage. Helium fuses into carbon um, while it's on that horizontal branch or the red clump. And then the AGB phase is when the helium runs out in the core. You have carbon in the core, but you still have some helium fusion outside and you still have some hydrogen fusion outside. You've got these shells where different types of fusion is happening. Um, so here's where it is on the diagram. So you started here. Your red giant star was up here and then it came down here and now it's up there. So this this track just shows you the changing temperature and luminosity of this star over the course of its post main sequence lifetime. Uh, eventually, what happens at this point now? Um, the core has no fusion in it, so it's shrinking. The outer layers are being pushed away from the energy pressure of those shells, and so it's expanding. And what you eventually have happen is the outer layers expand off and come off the star, leaving behind what was essentially the core. The core is super, super tiny, but super, super hot because it's collapsed to a certain point. Again, amount of matter getting smaller, getting squeezed, it heats up. So you have a really, really tiny, really, really hot star. That is your white dwarf star. So, pew! Uh, the track goes all the way over here and it just kind of peters off. But what's left behind of the core is this lower left part of the diagram. It becomes a white dwarf. Um, the, on its way there, 
um, while the white dwarf is in the center, before all the layers have completely left the area, uh, it creates something called a planetary nebula. These have nothing to do with planets. They're called that because when they were discovered, they looked planet-like, and so now we're stuck with that. Astronomers are bad at naming things. Um, but the what, what, what used to be the outer layers of this star have, you know, poofed off to the point where it's, it's uh, kind of see-through. It's this glowing nebula. Um, so this is an example uh, of one such nebula. Um, this is another one shows they don't necessarily poof off spherically nicely as a bubble. Um, this one had, you know, kind of two, not really jets, but two outflows coming from it. Um, and this is another one here. This one's really kind of faint. So eventually it fades away um, because the gas gets too spread out. It only lasts about 10,000 years. Um, that's, again, really long for humans, really short for astronomy. Okay, so what's left behind? So this was the size of the sun when it was on the main sequence. This is an A star, say, when it's on the main sequence. Uh, what's left behind is this tiny, 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 hot thing called a white dwarf. So it's super small, it's super dense. Um, a typical white dwarf, um, if it has, it's the mass, if, if what's left behind is the mass of one sun, it's the size of the Earth. So imagine all the mass of the sun squeezed into the size of the Earth. It's a really, really, really dense object. Okay. Um, and at this point, it's, doesn't, it's not undergoing any fusion. Um, there is a, a special state of matter that we call electron degeneracy. I don't want to get super into that. Um, but basically, because it, it's so compressed, it's pushed all the electrons that are orbiting the nucleus of all the atoms. It's pushed them so that they're all in the as low a level as they can be. There's no hopping up and down and making spectral lines and doing that stuff. Um, they're all as low as they can be. And that creates a type of pressure that pushes out and keeps it from collapsing forever. Um, so that's your white dwarf. And your white dwarf stars can be about as big as one, tell me this is right, 1.4 solar masses. Um, after that weird stuff starts happening. Um, get to that in a bit. Okay, so that, is the path of life for a sun-like star. Um, oh, here it is. Here's the path. So it starts as a nebula. So star forming region becomes a star. Uh, it goes through, this is simplified. It only shows one red giant stage. It kind of went through two. Um, and then uh, goes to a planetary nebula and a white dwarf. So that's a really short summary for a low or intermediate mass star. Okay, so now let's look at the bottom of this diagram. It's going to tell us what happens to a massive star, a star that is greater than um, eight solar masses, eight times the mass of the sun when it's on the main sequence. So that's going to be a hot whitish bluish star. Um, it's also going to go through giant phases, super giant usually, and then it's going to explode. And we'll get to that in a bit, in a second. So, what happens when you have a massive star? In fact, whatever, what happens when you have any star that's larger than a certain size? Um, we stopped, let me back up. For a sun-like star, we stopped with carbon in the center. Um, if a star is large enough, that collapsing carbon can get hot and high pressure enough that carbon fusion starts to happen. Um, let's get back to this. Uh, so you can have carbon fusion and that will create oxygen. So notice you're making bigger and bigger, more and more complex atoms, not to mention atoms that are really, really important for us here on earth, right? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, those are kind of the big three. Um, so you get carbon fusion into oxygen. The whole thing where like it shrinks and gets big happens again. So it kind of can burp, shrink, burp, shrink, uh, get bigger. Um, in this case, look at the timeline. The helium fusion to carbon is about 500,000 years. And then that runs out. The carbon to oxygen fusion stage is only 600 years. And then that runs out. 
and then the oxygen to so oxygen then fuses to make silicon that only happens for like six months and then <laughs> silicon fuses to make iron which is like a day so these are really ridiculously short time scales so these stars are changing rapidly over um this time so if it's changing rapidly over this time it's not staying at that particular temperature or, or luminosity for very long so when you look at a whole group of stars there's not going to be many of those stars there at any one point so that part of the hr diagram isn't going to have a lot of dots there's only going to be a few of these sitting around so these are usually your again your super giants um so you've got these different stages of fusion all the way up to the point where you have iron in the core and then something funky happens uh, if you try to fuse iron together, instead of giving off energy, it takes energy from its surroundings. So instead of the energy pressure pushing out, it starts pulling the energy from around it, making it collapse on itself even faster. So what you have happy, so here's the model of the core of that star, um, and the inside, the, the, that that part that's trying to fuse iron is going to collapse rapidly and then rebound <laughs> which will force the whole star to explode in something called a supernova so a supernova it's a really really bright event um a single star going supernova the brightness of that explosion could equal the brightness of the entire galaxy that it's in all can you not all you know 100 billion billions 100 billion stars of it so um you've created uh notice through fusion you started with just a hydrogen star or mostly hydrogen star you've created helium carbon oxygen silicon iron um the violence of this supernova explosion causes a whole lot more um what we call nucleosynthesis so creating new types of atoms creating new nuclei um and in fact most of the elements in the universe, so the naturally occurring elements on the periodic table, come from these high mass stars, stars greater than eight solar masses. Um, so this fun little uh, periodic table shows you um, different elements and the colors give you an idea of about how much of it is created through different, um, different processes. Uh, we'll talk about the Big Bang near the end of the course. Um, that created hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. Um, the dying low-mass stars can create some of these things, but high-mass stars, when they explode, they make the yellow ones. Um, and then some of this stuff, this is another type of supernova. Some of this stuff, um, the merging neutron stars, come from those high-mass stars. Um, that's the purple. So yellow and purple, as you see, that's pretty dominant. Um, all of these elements heavier than lithium up until about uranium or so um, are created somehow by stellar processes so they're created in the stars themselves through all these different types of fusion or created by the supernova or created by um, other weird things happening like what's left over from the supernova which is called a neutron star some called a neutron star um, forming um, new elements as well. So all of these elements come from the processes of stellar lifetimes. So the universe would be really boring, like hydrogen and helium and a tiny bit of lithium, uh, and that's it, <laughs> if it weren't for stars. We have carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, um, and all of these elements that are uh, essential to life because of all of these stellar processes. One thing, um, yeah, so the neutron star I mentioned here, um, just to give you an idea, if you have more than 1.4 times the mass of a star trying to form a white dwarf, more than that, it can overcome that electron degeneracy pressure and make something else, a neutron star. You can think of it as all the electrons get like squished into the nucleus, so there's no atoms, everything is neutrons. Um, neutrons are that they have neutral charge, no charge, um, and they're in the uh, nucleus of, of an atom. So basically the protons and the electrons <laughs> smash together, um, making a ball basically just of neutrons. It's a really weird type of matter. Um, 
if you had a neutron star the mass of the sun it's about the size of a city so that is this is a scale uh drawing showing you how big a neutron star with the mass of the sun would be uh hanging out over this is manhattan this is manhattan um this is long island this is new york city where i'm from originally um so it'd be the size of a city the sun smooshed into the size of a city um how, things even bigger than that eventually you can overcome even that neutron stuff and create a black hole instead whole next section is going to be about black holes because they're super weird and super cool um so i'm going to get to that but just to show you this overview again um star formation happens in a cloud um typically stars form together in clusters for a low or intermediate mass star so less than eight times the mass of the sun it'll go through some red giant phases once or several times and then eventually run out of stuff to fuse in the core and you get a planetary nebula that comes off and a white dwarf is what's left behind um, from what was the core. It's a very quiet death. It just kind of loses its, loses its layers slowly over time. Um, a massive star on the other hand, greater than eight times the mass of the sun. It'll go through its giant and super giant phases um, with different types of fusion, but eventually it hits iron and iron fusion causes the star to contract and explode, causing that supernova. And what's left behind from a supernova is either a neutron star or a black hole. So um, these processes, again, for massive stars might take, um, you know, hundreds of millions of years for these, oops, for these other stars, it's more on the order of billions of years. Um, so it's pretty cool to think that we've been able to figure out the physics of this, even though, you know, astronomy with telescopes has only been around for a little over 400 years. Um, so we've not been able to see an entire star go through a lifetime. Uh, you can kind of imagine if, if an alien race visited Earth and had like five minutes to photograph as many humans as possible and figure out the life cycle of a human from that. That's what uh, astronomers have had to do. Um, so using some physics, using some modeling, and using lots of observations and predictions and more observations um, to, to map out what this, um, what this lifetime is. Okay, actually, and in fact, um, this process has only been understood in the last 100 years. So or not even 400 years, so like 100 years or so. Okay, um, for the <laughs> for recap of that, low mass stars go through red giant phase, lose mass as a planetary nebula, leave behind a white dwarf. High mass stars go through several types of fusion until they get to iron, um, and then they go supernova, um, which is the explosion of a high mass star. The most of the elements on the periodic table are created through massive star fusion or explosions or even intermediate mass fusion star fusion as well um, and a supernova is that super bright explosion um, that's uh can be seen for you know way outside of a galaxy leaving behind this weird little neutron star or this even weirder thing we're going to talk about next time called a black hole